and yearn for it and long nice. for it and build up that desire so that when it actually happens and you're sitting in front of the Gemara or you're able to go ahead and engage in chesed or something, it's, it's alive. That, that, that's the lost princess. Welcome back to another episode of Open Book with Eitan and Itai. Thank so you happy so you could much. join us. Just my pleasure. want to give a huge mazal tov because my co-host got married last night. No way, mazal tov. Yeah, and uh, Mamash, I was sobbing. I was sobbing. I was so happy. Uh, I think like maybe like I just, I, I've just been married for a year now. I think if three months into my marriage, I don't think I could have smiled that much because three months into my marriage, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, what did I do? <laughs> But now I'm like, okay, this is the like best decision I ever made in my life. I only wish I could have done it earlier. So I was able to have a big smile for him, and we can't wait to have him back on the show in the right All time. Right. There's our Hopefully you can meet him also. It's a good reason the... not to be here. Right. <laughs> first night of Shev Baruch. It's beautiful. Right. Beautiful. Yeah, first night of Shev Baruch. Well, I can't believe it, so I'm so happy. So big mazel tov to Itai. Huge mazel tov. Yeah. Our Shem, you should be able to build a bias name of Yisrael and bring everything we're going to be speaking about tonight, the Shechina. The presence of God into his uh, into his house and family. Yes, yeah. uh, actually, that's a good place to to start off. One of the things I love about your book and just the story about the lost princess is all the different directions the story of the lost princess can go. And one of the things you speak about sp- specifically, even early in the book, is that you tie in the lost princess that in our relationships, in our marriage, there's the lost princess. That's right. You know, and in the in the beginning, just like in the beginning of the story. We know where the princess is, and then she gets lost. In the beginning of the marriage, especially Shanari Shana, or maybe even just during dating or just during engagement, you have this passion and excitement, and and a lot of people, unfortunately, without the right work and without the right effort and without the right adherence to halacha, uh, it goes away. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, it's something that <clears throat> we were just speaking about actually last night in the context of the seven-week course, The Lost Princess Principles, based on the book. And, you know, one of the universal elements of the book is the fact that it, it's able to apply, like you mentioned, to all areas of life, right? Even, I believe that the message ultimately of the book is able to be carried beyond the, uh, the framework of the religious world, or even the Jewish religious world, and beyond, I think, you know, to, to secular life in and of itself in terms of ambitions, in terms of any addiction. aspect, addiction, certainly, but any aspect of a person's life where a person would like there to be a, a passion, a focus, a cheshek, a desire, a ratzon, right? Ultimately, like you mentioned, somewhere, baderech, like Rabbi Nachman tells his story, along the way. So there's, there's a derech in everything. And somewhere, oftentimes, maybe most times, along the way, along that derech, or whatever it is that a person's engaged with, right? Whether it be marriage, parenthood, right, at the right time. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, ambitions, right? Any aspect of relationships, either with other people, with oneself, with the master of the world, with life, you know, as a whole. But ultimately, Baderech, says Rabbi Nachman, Siparti Maisa, I told this story along a journey, along that journey that all of us take as we're journeying deeper and deeper into our engagements with whatever area of life it is that we're trying to work on and focus on. And in the book, right in the beginning of the first chapter, we speak about the similarity between that word baderech in Rabbi Nachman's opening statement and the Pasuk referring to Amalek, which says, Asher karcha baderech. Then Amalek happens upon the Jewish nation by Derech along their journey out mm-hmm. of Mitzrayim on the way to Har Sinai. But as Rashi tells us based on Chazal, Asher Karcha could mean like Milashon Mikre, right? Something happened, happenstance. But it could also mean Milashon Kar, cold, like a Mikarer, like a fridge we spoke mm-hmm. about. And therefore, says Rabbi Nachman, Asher Karcha Baderech. Along the way, along the road, along the path that a person takes from the beginning of a timeline of a new relationship, of a new job, right, of a new community, of a new shul, of a new rav, of a new yeshiva, whatever aspect of a person's life, even writing, again in a secular, a writing a book, any 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 engagement that a person begins, there's going to be a derech, right? There's a process, right. and oftentimes a shakar chava derech, right? We we get cooled off, and that's synonymous hey, later on. Cold feet, yeah. yeah. Well, cold feet is a little bit in the be- like before you know the process begins. A person gets freaked out about it, but you can get cold feet, I guess, toward mm-hmm. the beginning as well. But that aspect of being cooled off and cold, and and you know, we call it the amaleki chill, you know, but not in a positive sense. Like chilled, it's the opposite. It's uh, it's it's a person that feels that something that's lost along the way. And in later chapters, when we speak about what the princess is and what that element of the desire and the cheshek and the feeling and the connection and the inwardness and the, and the genuine personal commitment to whatever it is that we're engaged with, 
the loss of that element mirrors the Asher Karcha Baderech, this that we get cooled off along the way. And so a prime example is marriage. We speak about the dating mm-hmm. period. We speak about, you know, engagement, this aspect of a deep, you know, desire and yearning and longing to be together, to be able to live together, to be able to start a life together. And there's that distance because ultimately it's not the right time yet, right? And uh, the sweetest thing is this, that a person is able to go ahead and to get married, but not to stop being engaged. People often think that there's the engagement period and then there's the marriage period, which sort of, well, you know... Like a, a marriage should be engaging. That's right. right. That's right. That's, the word that's engaging. Engaging. That's yeah. exactly right. And so the, the, the idea is, and I think this should be given over you know, to young couples in Hassanim, is that you don't stop being engaged you know, uh-huh. after you get married. Like that's not where the engagement period ends. Hopefully it never ends because engagement is the soul of marriage. It's marriage that brings two people together in this worldliness and the aspect of, you know, regular chores, obligations, the mundanities of day-to-day living with one another. Mm-hmm. But ultimately the engagement period, they're not actually in this world yet a couple together living as one. But in Shemayim, they're mamish one. And that's why Rabbi Nachman writes, that there was an old minute that we still do today. We do it by the wedding, but it used to be that the Tanaim was at the engagement where we break a plate, right? Mm-hmm. What's the shot that we brought? What's the reason that we break a plate like that? Rabbi Nachman explains is that until the engagement, these two souls were wandering the world one without the other, one without the other, all, all, you know, living their lives separately, not with one another. At the point of the engagement, we realize that these two souls are one. And that means that we take that plate, and we break it to show that at this moment it's revealed that they're whole, and now they're going to be apart just until the wedding, and then they're going to be back again. And that means to say that the engagement period is a oneness of heaven. That's the soul of the marriage, and the yearning, and the desire, and the excitement, and the cheshik. That's all the neshama of marriage. And then oftentimes what happens is, is that the marriage happens, which is the togetherness in this world, which can be likened to the body because we can see it, we can perceive it, right? It's the lived experience of both of them sharing their actual this worldly life with one another. But sometimes the soul gets lost along the way, the desire yeah. gets lost. And so the key is to preserve the engagement and the feeling of desire even after we already have that which we were desiring. It's, it's, I feel like it's the only way. You have to figure it out because you're going to be, Bezat Hashem, you get married, it's... It's for the long haul. So you, you, you want there to be, you want to like each other. You want to want to see each other. That's right. You know, your, your book this is a bit of a tangent, but your book came into my hands at a time where I was thinking, wow, I used to be the guy in, in yeshiva who was always excited to pray. And even when I lived in Chua, I was always early to Shachar and Mincha Arviet, and, and I loved it. And I liked praying to Hashem. And, you know, a lot of people, especially people who have been praying their whole lives and, and many on their whole lives, that's hard for them. And, and I had that. And I was thinking like, like what's happened to me? You know, I always end up a few minutes late to Mincha. It's, I, it's hard to get out of bed, this and that. And then that, I feel like part of what your book shows is that that's the natural process. You know, there's, there's a lot on, on the way that Emuna has the same Shoresh as Imun, as practice, as, as, right. as, a, as a, almost like a workout. And, and Emuna is a muscle and if, and, and, and it atrophies. And it's weird because you read a sefer on Emuna or you go to a class, you're like, all right, I got it. Like, that's it. <laughs> like, I got it. I'm good. And then like one month, two months, and then you're like nervous about Parnassai, you're nervous about this. Right, and, right. and and I'm like, and it's like, wait, what happened? That's right. Like, one, one of the things I like um, that Rabbi Arush points out, he's, he, he, he points out that, and I'm sure it's sourced from Rabbi Nachman, that anything you get in this world without Hebodidu and without prayer is not, not real. Right. Rabbi Nachman says it's like it's like an animal because an animal just gets, but it doesn't it doesn't pray well, right first to request it, and so you can get what you what you need, but if you didn't pray for it, that's not the human way of receiving. Yeah, that's Rabbi Nachman puts it in Sichas Wow, well, so 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 precisely that the praying and and the and the yearning and not just praying from a book, but praying what you want, making that connection with Hashem, talking to Him, telling Him what you want, or in this case, telling her what you want in in exactly in, right. in, in, in in a more accurate way in this in this sense. And, and I feel like that's, that's a huge part of what your book is about, is that search and that yearning and, and, and wanting I, for me personally, like I wasn't able to go to my yeshiva for the whole year because, because of Corona. But one thing I can say is all year I wanted to go. And every week I checked what the story was with it. And when I went, I was able to say, like, if I felt all those weeks of waiting and wanting, they just came in that one moment and I was like, they, that mattered. 
you know, so I, I just think that's amazing. That's exactly right. Nah, that's, that's the whole, that's the whole essence of the book really, right? Is to be able to find a way to regain that yearning. And the deep secret of the book is that the journey is the destination, Oh, is that in our journey to things, and sometimes we feel as if we're, you know, we're prevented and, you know, it's a bidiyev and we're not feeling our Yiddishkeit. There's a reframing that takes place by understanding that this experience in and of itself is an opportunity in the sense that it creates a space so that now we can yearn to cross it. And that yearning produces the soul, produces the spirit. Rabbi Nachman of Torah Lamed Aleph in the in the 31st lesson, Rabbi Nachman of Breslover writes that the soul of a person is caused and created by the yearning for something that one does not yet have. That's the animating wait, aspect wait, our, of the existence. Our, so, our soul gets... Cre- like, what does that mean? The soul of a person, in the sense of the vitality and the excitement oh, yeah. of living, is correlated and connected to this concept and this understanding of yearning, right? But also the soul of any engagement. We spoke about tefillah. The soul of tefillah is how much a person wants to pray. Yeah, that, right? Okay. And, and in exact accordance that's, with that's how much you when, want it... That's why it's hard when you have everything a person could want. Right. And people right. have difficulty. And um, we'll speak about yeah. that in a minute, about how to foster the, you know, the yearning for something even while you have it, right? Which is a big chachma. Because the idea isn't, you know, to specifically and consciously try to set yourself up in such a situation where you don't have anything so that at least what you have is, is yearning. No, we're supposed to go ahead and try to go ahead and, and have yeshivas and have our learning and have our davening. We'll speak right. about that in a minute. But Ibn Nachman says that this is the, the, the understanding of the Pasuk and Tilim that says, Nichsifa Vigam kalsa nafshi. Literally, this means that David Melech is saying, my, my soul yearned and longed, and the end of the Pasuk is, L'chatzos Hashem for the courtyard of God. So Rabbi Nachman sort of leaves out those last two words in the verse, and he says, Nichsifa vigam kalsa. This that a person yearns, this that a person desires, nafshi. That produces the nefesh. That itself produces the soul. No, it's not, it's not the traditional interpretation. Not no, not at all. It's the Hasidic, uh, you it's know, great. allegorical understanding, or, or, or uh, yeah, the deeper, the deeper level of understanding that. That that's what creates the soul. And so, what's so important is that it's not so much, you know, to give over a Yiddish kind of dogma to tell our kids what to do and what not to do, and so on and so forth. Because it's very possible that they can go ahead and you know, live their whole lives as perfect by the book halachic Jews, but ultimately if there's no personal desire for it, and if there's no feeling that this is genuinely something that I want to do, right, but there's simply a feeling that I'm doing this because society expects it of me, or my parent, my father, you know, mother wants me to, or the mashkiach and the yeshiva is going to get upset at me if I don't. Right. So then there's the goof, there's the marriage aspect, but the soul of the matter the yearning, that which is going to bring this activity to life, that's going to get the person to be there 10 minutes before and stay 10 minutes after and yearn for it and long for it and build up that desire so that when it actually happens and you're sitting in front of the Gemara or you're able to go ahead and engage in chesed or something, it's it's alive. That that That's the lost princess. That's the element of the princess that oftentimes gets lost along the way. That, that, that's what people say often when they when they go to a marriage counselor after 20, 30 years of being married. They they describe specifically that. They say, we've been going through the motions and it's not working. So theoretically, I guess even from a, like a scientific or a secular standpoint, you think, why not? He he helps around the house. He washes the dishes. He does this. She helps him with that. No, no, no. Makes dinner. What's wrong here? That's right. And, and no, there, there's something wrong. And also... If you like something I noticed in the, in the Shema, is that when Hashem describes, He says, "If you don't do this and that and that that, so X Y Z is going to happen." But but what does He say before that? He says that you'll become satiated and this and this, and then you'll turn away from Me. Right. And that's that's Davka what happens. So I I think for me personally, even it's like okay, like I have a you know. I, I did my conversion. I'm living here in Eretz Yisrael. I have my wife. You know, life is good. I have a roof over my head. Like, like enough. Like, enough with this connection stuff. Like, I got what I came for. And then it's like, all along, the connection is the thing. You know, you think, I'm, wow, like, wow, you know, someone's in the hospital or whatever. I really, like, Hashem healed them and then, and then. And you think, wow, like, the connection is to get those things. But the connection is for the connection. For the connection. And, and that's a mil- that's, and. Once you start looking at, at it that way, and I believe your book helps me look at it that way and re- reframe my mind and reframe my goals, it just, your whole life starts changing. That's right. Because it has to do with viewing everything as, as, as having a body and a soul, right? Which is itself a very Jewish idea, this, this, or a very spiritual or religious concept, which Judaism largely brought to the world, this idea that there's an exteriority 
and an interiority to everything. And when we start to understand that, we're not taken, you know, or we're not impressed by simply seeing something externally as functioning. A person is not fooled simply by seeing a couple that's together 40, 50 years. And like you described, you know, uh, there's no abuse, Baruch Hashem, everything's going fine, and he's doing what he's supposed to do, and she's doing what she's supposed to do, and they don't get angry at each other or yell at each other. But the question is, is there a neshama in this relationship, yeah, right? Exactly. Is there a soul in this relationship? And oftentimes that's what gets lost. You know, I mentioned before that there's the necessity to attempt consciously to foster this sense of yearning even after we already have what it is that we're yearning for. So take the standard single, right? Especially, you know, older singles, which is an issue that's prevalent today, specifically in the firm world. And you have people that are that are yearning for years and davening and schoolists and kvarim and rabbanim and brachas and, and their whole life is consumed by this, rightly so. And then they get <laughs> married, right? Mazel Tov, and we bless everybody that they should find their zivug, hagun bakar of mamish. And they get and they get married and they stand under the chuppah and then with time, even it could be a matter matter of months, certainly a matter of years, all of a sudden, you know, they, they don't have that same feeling that they had initially because the object of their yearning is here. And they they have right they they, they like you said, we they got what they came for, right. right? So the question is, how do we go ahead and foster a sense of yearning, right? The same way that we did previously. And I think that one of the answers is, and we speak about this in the book, is to consciously enter that experience of lack to again try to consciously go back into that feeling what was that like to be alone or and it's sometimes can be a scary thing to think about right and obviously you know our power our our mind and our thoughts have tremendous power so a person should be cautious about this but to think you know what would i feel if i if i no longer had this person which is which is ostensibly a possibility i mean obviously we should all live long and happy till 120 but nothing's guaranteed and so trying to enter into that mindset that can help us foster that sense of yearning what we call that in the book is gratitude right is this ability to be grateful for something what's the inner workings what's the inner what's the soul of gratitude the soul of gratitude is this feeling of yearning this feeling of yearning to say that even while I'm standing next to the person, I feel that I, that I have them already, I'm still yearning for them as if I didn't. And that preserves that feeling of gratitude to say, Master of the world, I'm grateful for this, that I don't feel that it's coming to me. I don't feel in the language of the story like the princess, Episatog, right? We speak about just, just another day. Oh, oh days a yom. Just, you know, we take it for granted that her relationship with the king, which is why the king feels that he needs to send her away, right? And she thinks that, the way in which he's sending her away in such a strong way that he says, let the no good one take you. She believes that that's what he means. But what's the king, which is the master of the world, what's the king doing? What he's doing is he's saying, I want to create a space so that we can re-foster that sense of yearning so that once more there can be a soul to our relationship. Once more, there can be this yearning and this feeling of gratitude so that when we get together, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to the Jewish soul, it shouldn't just be this very business-like, you know, okay, I came, you know, in the beginning of davening, I left at the end of davening, tefillin, check, tzitzis, check, you know, in a very, very, like, technical way, yeah. but it should be that tefillah certainly is avodah shebelev, rachman aliba boy. HaKadosh Baruch Hu primarily wants the yearning. The Noam the Melech says that all the mitzvahs are only indicators that your yearning had reached the point of fulfilling the obligation. And you did a mitzvah. You know, but the ikr, but the primary thing and what's important to God is not the actual act of the mitzvah. It's the yearning that was so powerful that it enabled us to go ahead and to overcome any obstacles to getting out of bed and laziness and so on and so forth, self-sacrifice, to go ahead and to do the mitzvah. But the mitzvah is not the main thing. The mitzvah is only the indicator that we fulfilled our obligation of yearning, so much so that we did the mitzvah, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't know how to qualify. Well, how do you know if you yearned enough? That's what the mitzvahs are. They're vessels for our yearning. And when we go ahead and engage in the halachic Judaism, in all the mitzvahs that are supposed to help us protect and supposed to help us, you know, have vessels filling our lives so that they can be filled with that yearning and desire and we get obsessed with those to the point that we lose the princess not despite but specifically because of our obsession and engagement with all the details of the law and we don't realize that all those details are meant to enable us to stay focused on the princess and what it's all about it's tragic it's really tragic right and this happens in our own lives but ultimately i believe that it's happened largely to uh to the firm community or in the life of the firm community as time goes on baderich Right, as we've taken our journey through exile. And now it's time, right before Mashiach, to begin again to reclaim this, this das, this consciousness. So we're going to speak more about that. First, I want to tell our listeners about Pomerantz Bookseller.
Your favorite bookstore, Pomerantz Bookseller, still going strong as ever, selling books to the Jewish public in Yerushalayim and the entire world. You can contact them at 02-623-5559 for all your Judaica needs, whatever book you want, however obscure they'll do it, their, their very best to have it available. If they don't have it available, they'll even do their very best to get it in for you. They offer delivery all over Israel and all over the world. And they're going to be coming out soon with a very amazing, special, wonderful website. Check them out. 02-623-5559. That's 02-623-5559. All right, everybody. Back to the show. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> so we were speaking, we left off before the break speaking about gratitude and how, how critical it is in a, in a relationship. Obviously, you know, not just, not just in our marriage or with our friendships or with our, you know, a boss employee um, uh, relationship, but particularly with the creator that we feel this gratitude and, and with, with all relationships that we feel this gratitude. And that's how you maintain the yearning and the passion and the realization that I used to not have this and I wanted this so bad. That's right. And, uh, and that, I think that creates like even just love, love. Know? Yeah. Desire, intimacy, closeness, soul, soul. Right. Ish isha. Right, it says about marriage, if a, if a man and a, and a woman are zocha, shechina, shri, b'nei. Right. right, and the shechina is the princess. The shechina is associated with the sphere of malchus, without getting into the depth of it, right, but that's the, that's where the shechina is, and the princess is there in that marriage. Have you, what's, I know that there's been a lot, we've, we've spoken that there's been a lot of Jews, obviously, that your book has affected since it's been published, and there's even people who have been in, you know, in chinuch for decades. That's right. And either they've ordered your book or they told you that this changed their whole whole approach. Has there been has there been any uh, has has your book influenced any anyone not Jewish? I, I you know it's hard to know today. It's hard to know. Right. You put something out on Amazon, you never know who finds it. Certainly, secular Jews you know have connected with LPI and have connected yeah. with me personally. And so you know, I people ask you know, are you in care of you know? I'm, I'm primarily in care of Krovim, You know, in the sense that I'm not trying to target or reach uh, secular Jews per se, um, but I think that it's going to be able to be a lot more of a natural process when the from world is on fire with the princess of Yiddishkeit. It's going to be a much easier sell, you know, when we're not dogmatic about it, but we have all the halachic dogma that's bursting with the spirit of the princess. And when our Shabbos is not running after cars and screaming Shabbos and throwing rocks, you know, but our, our, our Shabbos is going to be so glorious and so illuminated and so lichtig, you know, that, that people are just going to naturally want to be drawn toward it. So in a right. way, I'm involved in Kerev Rechokim, right? But in an indirect sense. But I, I primarily feel that, you know, the, the from world in and of itself, with all of its incredible, incredible, you know, Milus with 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 all of what it is, and I mean, we could talk for the next ten years now about oh, about how special and beautiful and wonderful you know the from world is, and how miraculous we've managed to build this incredible, incredible uh, structure. You know, after near decimation only seventy years ago, it's miraculous, yeah. completely miraculous. But I believe that you know Mashiach uh, demands a little bit more. You know, we can do more, and we are doing more, and things are getting better all the time. You know, but uh, you know, so so outside of that curve, Krovim sort of direct impact, but I do, you know, on the side, right on the side, I mean, it sounds like a job. If I'm privileged enough, you know, I will be contacted by even those who are not yet in the fold, but are very intrigued by this idea of a from Orthodox Judaism, that's primarily a mystical system, that's primarily interested in experiential spirituality, which is something that people think just on the surface, you know, is, uh, is not present, you know, in halachic Judaism. Well, I, I think that's a huge, I think that's a huge paradox. And I see this, you know, I grew up going to, to a conservative synagogue and there's singing and connection. And I, I like, I'm a much felt Hashem, like I'd pray and, 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 and I felt the connection. Some people may say I was feeling something else, but whatever it was, I felt passion and I felt him. And then sometimes you can go to, uh, you know, an Orthodox minion and you might not feel that, or you'll, you'll see someone who, who just converted and obviously they're, they're in their honeymoon phase and they're like, Oh my right, gosh, I'm right. Jewish. I had a brief Milah. Ah, like they're just going crazy. And that's Dafka. The paradox is that the people that keep the, all the halachot and stuff, sometimes they don't feel it. And then you, you see, you see, tradi you see traditional Jews or you see it obviously with cab drivers that aren't religious. Sure, and Eretz sure. Like the Emuna and Bitachon, it, it's, it's beyond anything, anything you can achieve by, you know, like, like we, like I, I mentioned it before, by doing that dime exactly correct and all this, like there, some people just, so you know, so obviously with the story of the Chacham Batam. So some people, 
have achieved that level of tam, and then you you look at them and you know with the context of Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman's class, you do it. You're like, all I'm doing in my Judaism is to get to be like that guy. Yes, but 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 again, yes and no. Meaning the the way in which I'm always teaching is that balance is the key. In the context of the story of the story of the lost princess, we speak about how the king has six sons and one daughter. Mm. And the six sons are going to represent, I think that we spoke about this last yeah. time, the six sons represent, you know, the external structures, right? All the aspects of the uh, the, the practical details, Natila Sedaim, right? was the example that you mentioned, Tfila, that's in a specific kind, right? Not just completely spontaneous and individualistic, but very specific, structured, Dachami, and so on. stuff like that. That's right, right. All, of the, all of these aspects of our structural halachic life, right? And Judaism is very much uh, concerned with the six sons of how to live. And the way in which, you know, I perceive, <clears throat> excuse me, the ideal vision of what a firm world can look like is when all of those details and the, and the minutia of every single area of halacha is followed, but is then filled with the spirit of the princess in the sense that we reframe what those elements are for. Why are we doing these things, right? The why is present within the how, the what, the where, and the when. And so in a certain way, you speak about conservative, um, you know, uh, communities. You speak about, you know, different, yes, different, yeah, alternative, you know, spiritual communities. And you know, I don't think that those people are feeling something else. Uh, on the contrary, I think that they very much are feeling. Their neshamas are just as on fire as, as, as ours hopefully are, right? And, and what they're feeling is, is what they're feeling. Ultimately, you know, it's not up to us to decide how God wants to be served. Ultimately, our Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us a Torah, and there's a very specific, uh, you know, a framework in the, for, for how HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to express our yearning and our desire. And oftentimes, sometimes you can see a person even who will go ahead and perform a mitzvah without any external passion or, or, or fire, but just the very fact that one needed to constrict his own desire to serve God in his own way, and then went ahead and, you know, overcame that and put on tefillin in a specific constricted way, following those halachas, that bespeaks a certain love right. that may be imperceptible, but ultimately is even more powerful than, you know, someone else who's just dancing wildly, you know, on, right. on, on Shabbos with a chauffeur and a, and a boombox. You know, you understand? We, uh, we had we had an author on the show and she said that th- there's something to be said for uh, doing doing something that you don't want to do. Right, right. And that's the expression of the deepest love. For example, if you look in the Medrash Tan Huma in Parshas Noah, he goes very, very deeply into how learning Gemara which to many people is the most dry, technical, legalistic, six sons aspect, but just to be engaged in that limud with all the difficulty and the nuance and the complexity and oftentimes the darkness. Chazal themselves say, b'machshak im hoshivani, right? David Amalek says, you've placed me, I think it's Eov rather, says, you've placed me in darkness, zut Talmud Bavli. Right? The Babylonian, Babylonian Talmud is associated with darkness. It's difficult, it's tedious. And the Medrash Tan Chuma says this is the deepest love letter to God that we could ever write by sitting in front of black and white text. There's nothing overtly spiritual about it, right? And so, of course, I believe that the Medrash Tan Chuma is speaking about an engagement with such a text, but still with the kavana and with the intent and with that experience and the expression consciously of the fact that God is present in this experience. And this is my way of expressing my love for him. And when we do that, when we take the spirit of the princess and allow it to animate all the details of our halachic engagements, I mean, that's the, that's the ideal. That's the ideal. And halacha allows every detail of our lives. It's not restrictive. It's not a fence that's created to keep us in. It's a fence that's created to preserve something so beautiful within that framework so that every aspect of my life is walked within the framework and the pathway of reminders every moment. It's a reminder that God loves me. It's a reminder that I can express my love to God through tying my shoes in a specific way, through eating in a specific way, through sleeping in a certain way. Every single detail and the life cycle of life is surrounded by not laws and needing to do certain things and not being allowed to do certain things, but opportunities to allow my internal yearning and desire for a relationship with God to come to expression. And that changes the way that we look at Allah. So about, I think, maybe 18 months ago, I saw a recommendation on Facebook for something called the Lost Princess Initiative. So I was like, okay, I, I've heard of this. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've read the story of the Lost Princess. It's something where I mean, I'll yeah, give it a like. Let's see, see what happens. And then it's become a full-fledged thing. Now you mentioned LPI uh, earlier in the show, which is Lost Princess Initiative, which you're the founder of. 
So what is the Lost Princess Initiative and what do you what do you hope to achieve? You know, we, we have a bit of an idea based on what we're sure. speaking, but I think more than what do you hope to achieve? How, how, how are you, how are you doing it? How are sure. you setting out on, sure. on that journey? Uh, the first, I mean, to, to answer the second question, first, how is all Siyat There's no, right. there's no, there's no method to the madness. It's all tefillah and it's, and it's complete, complete and total and utter Siyat yeah. And I say that for real. I mean, I, I just, you know, Hashem is just sending down ideas and, and, and connections and the right people and the right shluchim and, and the right partners financially and otherwise to be able to help me do this. You know, so I'm, I'm the founder. God is the founder. I'm a little, you know, puppet and he's pulling the strings, but things are happening in the world. Um, you know, but basically everything that we've spoken about in a sense of what the princess is, what it means, asher karcha baderech, that we lose that feeling in our Yiddishkeit, that's all in this book, right? This would be the textbook trying to bring to the world what the derech of the Baal Shem Tov is, what it means that the Baal Shem Tov wanted to create a spiritual renaissance, what was missing that the Baal Shem Tov felt, you know, he needed to focus on and try to give us tools and drachim and different ideas and to implant within us the consciousness ultimately to prepare us for the time when Mashiach comes, when the Navi says, Umala Ard's Deil Ladas is Hashem, Kamayim Liyam Achasim, right? The world will be filled with the knowledge of God. Das, das also means instant intimacy. Yeda Adam as Chava Ishto. Chava and his wife Adam and his wife get together. That's called Das. That's called intimacy, right? Das is intimacy. That the world will be filled with the intimacy of God. Right? The Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit, which is the very first halacha in the Raman Shulchan Aruch, right in the beginning, because it's the premise of all the halachas that follow. Very much, you know, we, we began to speak about that aspect, right? Of what that is. Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit. Behold, Drachecha de Ehu. And all of your paths know him, right? And I felt, you know, in writing this book that there hadn't yet been one single safer that really gets to the, to the very core of what it is that this derech, you know, is coming to be mechadish. What this novel approach is, what this idea that the Baal Shem Tov wanted to bring to the world, what is it, right? And so this book really focuses much in the context of the Baal Tshuva, what it means to be a person that's always returning, always approaching on an odyssey, on a journey where the spiritual experience is it's just that. It's an experience and it's not just a dogma, you know, so that's all wrapped up into this book. The Lost Princess Initiative is ultimately an educational platform that seeks to take these ideas and to spread them. And to really bring them to educators, to parents, to students, across the spectrum of age and background and language and where we live all around the world, with all of our various audio and video and all different kinds of content that we're sending out over social media daily, different programs that we have, different publications that we put out, our Shabbos newsletter, and uh, and, and, and weekly shir, and many different sort of you know channels to be able to get these ideas to Am Yisrael because people feel this intuitively. I think that there's a tremendous awakening that's happening, that's been happening for the past 10, 15 years where people Namash. feel, Namash. Uh, you know, yesh mashu chaser, there's something missing and they can't put their finger on it and they feel that there's something wrong with them, that they're alone and everybody else seems to be cruising along the highway and they're just trying to, you know, battle through the thicket of the weeds of their own personal experience and they've been speaking to God in their own words and they never understood that there was somebody at Sadiq or Benachman Abreslev who made that into a derech. They've been yearning for God and they don't understand why they're, you know, the only loners, you know, not involved in the sports and an entertainment, but they feel there's something more to life and they feel weird, you know, but the secret is there's thousands of us and ultimately our generation at the core. So you're trying to reach those thousands. Right. We're trying to reach and we are reaching Baruch Hashem increasingly Hashem. so those thousands, but I believe that that yearning is dormant within every single Jewish soul and people just don't know the options out there. They don't know that there's other studies within Judaism that are not Gemara and Alacha. They don't know that there's Hasidas. They don't know that there's an entire body of literature that's deep that's going to enable us to, ta- to tap in and to engage in our halachic Judaism in a way in which it transforms everything, every definition of a mitzvah, of what Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is, right, of what neshama is, of what, of what the master of the world is, becomes completely and entirely transformed through the, the prism of this, you know, of this understanding. So that's what we're trying to do in all of our various uh, expressions. That's great. Um, so basically, we're doing a special offer on the story of our lives by Rabbi Yaakov Klein. If you want it, and if you want a good, great, amazing, wonderful price on it, if you're the first three people to call the store, you'll get half off on it, sponsored by the podcast. And you can call 02-623-5559. That's 02-623-5559. If you're not one of the first three, don't worry. You can still call. We'll give you 10% off. We can't wait to see the book in your hands. Amen. 
Uh, Rabbi, Better thank you so calling. much. Yeah. Thank you so, so 100% much. 100% call now. Thank you so much. It's and a good luck with um, with your derech and Amen. with helping other people. With our, our derech. With our derech. Collectively. Thank you. Amen, Rabbi. Thank you so much.